Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to another debunking video. I think it's fair to say that a lot of people don't really understand how the scientific community works, and that's okay. It's not like we have a big PR team who films graduate students, postdocs, and professors in their daily lives and shows you what goes on in research labs every day. But whatever the reason, there does seem to be a relatively popular or at least easy to believe idea that science can be bought. And honestly, I can understand where the propensity to believe such a thing might come from. There are a couple of historical examples that people might point to to say that science can be bought. But is that really true? Can science actually be bought by special interest groups to say a certain thing when the evidence says something completely different? When your friend or weird uncle at the Thanksgiving dinner table says that scientists are just being paid to say whatever the government wants them to say, is that really a valid argument? What should you maybe say to them? Well, hopefully this video will help with all those questions, and I'm going to explain the story that I like to call Pots Tots. And no, this video won't be as cringy as the episode of The Office that inspired the title, Scott's Tots. At least I hope it won't be as cringy. Anyway, in this video, I'm going to explain the science behind the historical example that probably most people point to to support their view that science can be bought, which is the tobacco industry. So today we know for sure that smoking cigarettes increases the risk of cancer. This is obvious today. I don't think many people would deny that. But for decades, the tobacco industry denied that that was the case. Because obviously they had a special interest in saying that their products did not cause cancer so that people would not be deterred from buying their products and they would be able to make more money. And there are actually examples of the tobacco industry paying scientists to publish pieces critiquing actual evidence that cigarettes directly cause cancer. This was all to give the illusion that there was actually a debate in the scientific community on whether or not cigarette smoke caused cancer. And the truth is there wasn't. You see, often there's a disconnect between what is going on in the popular media and what the scientific literature is actually saying. And we know that the popular media is heavily influenced by interest groups, and the reporters who are telling the stories don't always have all the facts, and sometimes they just want to report the most inflammatory story that is going to get the most viewers. Because journalism is a business, and they want to keep you reading or watching whatever they're putting out. So they don't always get the facts right. But in their defense, in order to get the facts about a scientific issue correct, they have to be familiar and up-to-date with the scientific literature. And scientific literature is not written for the general public to read easily. It's written for scientific colleagues to read and critique, and for them to build their work upon the work of others. And scientists are not always trained to effectively communicate their work to lay people or journalists or even to want to seek the opportunities to do that at all. So to try to distill that down to one sentence, science literacy is not very high in the average person, but scientists don't really help that issue. So while the tobacco industry was creating this illusion that there was a scientific debate, what did the literature actually say? Well, to explain that, we have to go all the way back to the 1770s to a man called Percival Pott. Percival Pott was an English surgeon. English surgeon. English surgeon. English surgeon. And he had several notable finds that he could name to his career. For example, there's Pott's fracture, Pott's disease of the spine, and Pott's puffy tumor. Ugh, that doesn't sound good. But one disease that does not have his namesake is chimney sweeps carcinoma. And that's a really important point to this whole story. Because what Percival Pott observed is that chimney sweeps, who were normally young boys because those young boys were small enough to fit into chimneys in order to actually clean them, were getting very high rates of carcinomas. Man, you know, say what you want about today's work culture, but at least we don't got little teenagers running into chimneys to clean them out for the upper class. Oof. Anyway, the observation that these chimney sweeps were developing specific cancers at a higher rate than other people was one of the first observations of occupational cancer risk. 
Occupational cancers are, of course, cancers that pose a higher risk to certain occupations. For example, people like miners and factory workers might be at higher risk of lung cancer due to asbestos exposure. That's why those mesothelioma commercials are part of your core memories. If you or a loved one was diagnosed with mesothelioma, you may be entitled to financial compensation. You can thank Percival Pot and his modern-day child labor law-breaking tots for that. Anyway, it wasn't just an epidemiological observation that Percival Pot made. He was a surgeon, so he also noticed that there was soot in these tumors that these children grew. So right from the 1770s, there was an implication that soot or smoke would be a cause of cancer. Another British surgeon named Sir James Earl continued this work and observed that farmers who used soot to kill slugs had a higher likelihood of developing skin carcinoma on their hands. And throughout the decade, scientists did what scientists do. They built upon the work of others that came before them. In fact, as early as the 1890s, Fritz Lickint, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, Germans, published a meta-analysis citing 167 other studies that linked tobacco smoke specifically to lung cancer. These observational studies continued throughout the 20th century. Other experiments included ones where scientists took tar from tobacco smoke and painted it onto rabbit's bare skin, and those patches of bare skin had a higher likelihood of developing skin cancers. And finally, around the 1950s, there were very large cohort studies that showed pretty convincingly that smokers were more likely to die younger, be at higher risk of heart attacks, and higher risk of cancers, including most notably lung cancer. And that same black tar that scientists would paint on rabbit's skin that would cause that skin to form cancers could be found in the lungs of heavy smokers during surgeries or autopsies. So given all of this, it was pretty much a no-brainer that tobacco smoke definitely increased the risk of lung cancer, among other negative health outcomes. This led in 1964 to the U.S. Surgeon General releasing a report stating that there was a significant cancer risk with cigarette smoke. This led many smokers to quit. However, in the first half of the 20th century, despite all of the epidemiological and observational studies done up until that point, neither the public nor most physicians recognized a significant health threat from smoking. So it took the U.S. Surgeon General's report to significantly start to change the American public's perception. It wasn't the research, it wasn't the evidence, it wasn't the scientific literature. During the late 20th century and early 21st century, when molecular genetic technology was coming into the forefront, and we were able to accurately determine the mechanisms by which tobacco smoke actually caused cancer in a very specific way. There were several studies published showing that tobacco smoke specifically leaves a kind of fingerprint of damage on DNA that directly causes cancer, and I'll link them all in the description so that you can read them yourself. Just know that the mutations found in smokers with lung cancers that were found at critical cancer-controlling genes like TP53 and KRAS were not random. They were specific and the same across multiple cases of smokers who had lung cancer. And yet, the tobacco industry tried to hire a few scientists to publish critiques against this work, saying that it was not a confirmed causal link. They were trying to do anything they could to save themselves from the scientific community demonstrating conclusively, causally, that smoking caused cancers. But these attempts did not go far at all. And Dr. Hynot, one of the first scientists to publish these kinds of data, his reaction just says it. He says, I was shocked. And so the first reaction when you see a paper like this attacking your work is, oh my god, I've missed something very important. I've made a big mistake. In fact, when the first of these papers came out, my director called me into his office and said, what's this about? You have three days to bring all of your data to me for review, because if you've mishandled or misrepresented an issue like that, it's a serious matter. So I was somehow in the hot seat. So yeah, the tobacco industry was trying to really heavily influence public opinion by hiring these scientists to publish these very flawed pieces critiquing this work. And while it had the intended effect of creating this scare that maybe this work was not valid, it was quickly squashed within the scientific community. Because Hynot's results stood up to the scrutiny that followed. This work was not only replicated, but expanded upon and continued to be vindicated by other 
scientists from all over the world. So while the tobacco industry could buy a few scientists to try to influence public opinion, they could not buy the scientific community. I've said this before on my channel, and I'll say it again. The scientific community is basically a bunch of hyper-competitive nerds who all want to prove each other wrong. So if you make a mistake and another nerd finds out about it, you are not going to hear the end of it. And now, thanks to the scientific community, even the general public understands that tobacco smoke does cause cancer. So despite the vast monetary power and influence the tobacco industry had, they could not buy the scientific community to their side. But even though this is such an important and taken-for-granted fact today, the names involved in discovering and establishing this fact are practically unknown. People like Gerd Pfeiffer, Pierre Hynot, Stephen Friend, Richard Dahl, Austin Bradford Hill, Fritz Lickint, and of course, Percival Pott, and his very unfortunate tots. All of these people stood on the shoulders of giants who came before them. They learned from the hard work and research that others laid out before their time so that they could build on the human knowledge that we have and improve lives moving forward. That is what science is all about, and that is how the scientific community works. The scientific community builds on those who came before them and works with people all over the world from different disciplines and different backgrounds to build on this work and get us to a new place of knowledge that can help us advance our civilization one way or another. The scientific community is not perfect. It's not always right, but it is usually the best we have. So no, you cannot buy the scientific community. Just like how you cannot buy a hyper nerd of the Lord of the Rings universe to say that Viggo Mortensen didn't break his toe when he kicked that helmet, you're not going to be able to buy the scientific community in saying something that is totally ridiculous and not supported by the evidence. If you want to know the truth about these things, you got to dive into the literature or listen to experts who know what they're talking about. And if you're not sure that your favorite influencer knows what they're talking about, do dive into the scientific literature and see if it matches what they're saying. Anyway, that is going to do it for this week's video. It was a little different from what I normally do, but I really felt like this was an important topic to talk about, and I hope that you found it interesting to listen to. And like always, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. All of the links to the science and history that I'm talking about in this video are linked in the description below so that you can read about it yourself and dive deeper into it than what I could explain in this video. And in addition to the links that I'm providing in the description, I can highly recommend these two books. One is P53, The Gene That Cracked the Cancer Code. It's all about this gene, TP53, which is a regulator of cancer. It suppresses cancer growth, and it describes the history of this gene, the protein, and the tobacco industry as well. And also in terms of just general scientific community and how it works, The Invention of Air by Stephen Johnson is a fantastic read. It really drives home the point that science is not just an ivory tower endeavor where it's a few people alone in a bubble deciding what the science says. It's really a community collaborative effort. And if you enjoyed this, then don't forget to like and subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.